Hey, everybody. Are we ready for the next talk, which now I know the schedule of. I got the correct schedule, and I'm genuinely also excited about this one because interoperability is a very, very important subject, and it's very, very current in terms of how we're going to actually uh, bring these technologies together and how we're going to transfer value between trains. So Costas is here to do this talk, and everybody give him a hand and welcome him on stage. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, this is fine, I guess. Okay. Um, cool. Um, my, my name is Kostis. Um, I, I work at IHK. Um, I will be giving this talk with my colleague Dionysus Zindros, who is a PhD student at the University of Athens. Um, so I guess let's start. Uh, I also have a clicker. Yeah, that's better. Um, okay, so in this talk we'll kind of have a discussion about what a sidechain is and we'll... There were some talks before that were talking about sidechains, but I will probably redefine what a sidechain is. <laughs> And um, then we will basically see how we can build on top of a sidechain to, to build a two-way peg, which is basically an, an asset that, that is shared through different uh, crypto, um, different chains, basically. And um, then in order to do that uh, efficiently, we'll see proofs of proof of work, which uh, will Dionysus will present. So let's, let's quickly talk about sidechains. Um, so Th this is actually a very nice, um, a very nice uh, uh, diagram here, which shows two chains which are completely not related to each other. Like they have different genesis, and um, we can see that the, this white block basically depends somehow on this black block, which is on another chain. And um, this is kind of the theme here. We want chains that are completely heterogeneous and and different to be able to kind of um, um, see information about each other. So what happens here? Um, I'm, I'm going to use as an example Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Uh, this, it's like a, it's, um, it's, it's easier this way. And um, so what we have here is these chains, like they grow over time until at some point some event happens, which we denote with this, this frog. And this event happens on, on Ethereum in this case. And then what we want to do is basically say, okay, um, we, we would like to know about this event on the, on the Ethereum Classic chain. And here we denote the fact that we know about it with another frog. And we basically can react to this event in any way we could react to this event on, on, on Ethereum. So this is a, like the, the, the big idea about interoperability, right? We want to, to be able to, to react to an event on another chain. So we have some terminology here which will be useful to, to, to go through. Then we have, in this case, the Ethereum is uh, the source chain, like the, 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 the chain in which the, the event originates. And uh, Ethereum Classic is a destination chain. We also call it a target chain. And so um, basically, um, he, here we have some um, requirements for this. Um, we would like for um, the, the blockchains to be uh, proof of work, but it's not a strict requirement, but it's, this is a case we're going to look at today. And we have some examples of, um, of some cryptocurrencies that are proof of work. And, um, and then uh, in order to do some of the more advanced stuff that we want to do, we also have the requirement that uh, cryptocurrencies also support um, smart contracts. And um, we are going to do some advanced stuff that we will really take advantage of the smart contract capabilities. And this is kind of a departure from all the previous talks, which were kind of about Monero. Monero doesn't really have smart contract capabilities. So this is, I guess, a, a nice change of pace. <laughs> um, so um, I, when I showed the frog there, it's like it's, it wasn't really obvious what, what, um, what it represented. And, um, so we'll make it more specific. An event can be something like, okay, this transaction, like I, this transaction happened on some chain, or this block was mined, which I don't know has this particular property. Its, it's hash has like I don't know seven at the end or something, and or changes in the account balances, um, and um, other kind of events like solidity events. So for those of you who don't know, solidity has events that can be fired and they're recorded permanently and they can be used by other applications and we are actually going to make heavy use of those solidity events and now there's there's another thing which is important which is okay someone could say I I can do this by um, having having the miner on the destination chain 
observe the, the source chain and he can confirm or they can confirm the what what happened on the source chain but we it's uh, we we don't have to we, won't, we don't want to place this burden on the miner and we actually what, what we try to do in this work is we try to say how can we do this without actually affecting the base layer and without requiring changes um, consensus layer changes. So we have a property which we call minor isolation, which is very important. And our, what, what, I'm, what I'm going to present is actually um, um, uh, does have this minor uh, isolation property. So um, we, we are going to start with a smart contact, which is called cross-chain. This, this slide here shows that this is actually on the destination chain. And we're basically going to, like our work in this will be to tell the smart contract that some event happened on the source chain. And this all starts with like this, the, all the smart contract knows is a genesis of the source blockchain. This is all the information it needs in order to operate. And this is what we denote here. So we kind of construct the smart contract with the genesis of the source blockchain. Now, um, we, we, we saw what an event is. Now, We'll see how we can prove such an event happened. And we have two um, uh, important pieces. One is the event itself. Like we, we want to have some description of the event. And another is a, a proof that the event happened. And um, uh, when an event happens, it gets stored so that we can use it for other things later. And we'll see how we can use it. We will actually make use of it. So what does a proof look like? Um, we for now we will look at uh, very simple proofs which are uh, SPV like if anyone's familiar with the term which is basically um, something some some event that happened basically take, took place in a block so I want to prove to you that this block is actually in the best source blockchain and uh, and uh, this this um, this event or this transaction is included in that block so the way I do it is I provide to you the, uh, the chain of headers. And uh, I provide to you a Merkle, Merkle proof of inclusion for the block in that I'm interested in. And um, th this is not what we are actually going to end up with. Uh, we, this is not like incredibly efficient. And there are ways to improve it with HippoPowers, which Dionysus will present in a bit. Um, but you, this is not enough, basically, because um, so the, the information this contract has is very limited and someone could lie about it. Someone could provide a valid chain that contains some transaction that is actually not in the best source blockchain. And how we avoid that is we say, okay, um, you claim now that this happened, but we will offer, we will start a contestation period so that if someone disagrees with you, we will provide them with the opportunity to say, okay, I disagree and this is why I disagree. They, so they will provide a contesting proof that basically your proof will be compared against and if it is found out that the that the person who contests um, is is right, they basically gain some collateral. Um, um, otherwise, like nothing happens. And when the contestation period ends, um, the, um, the uh, yeah, I'll, I'll actually I'll circle back to the collateral thing because it's it's more important. The the important part is here that you have fraud proofs in case the first person was lying. So this is again now a recap of the of the SPV protocol. So we have two provers. These are actually uh, parties that submit things to to the smart contract, and they submit their um, uh, chain, the, the header chain, and both submit the chains, and they are basically compared. In this very simple scenario, the comparison happens with by checking which chain is the longest, but it can also be which chain has the most proof of work, which is in Bitcoin, and so on. So let's look at the contract. This is a function that is, I hope this works. OK, this is good. So this is a function that gets called on the smart contract when someone wants to say, OK, this event happened on another chain. And um, it, has, um, it has a proof, which is this pi. And it has the, the, the event that they basically came and happened. So the event could be, you know, this transaction happened to this address. And then the, the important thing is, before we go there, the important thing is, when, they, when someone does this claim, they also have to put down some collateral, so which can be taken from them in case they're lying, which is the thing I wanted to talk back to. So um, the, um, this, this if statement here is, is it verifies that they have actually put collateral. And then we basically store, store this event 
that they say, okay, this is the author, which is a person who called, it the, um, called this function, and this is a proof that they use. And then we say, okay, now a contestation period begins, and it will end uh, after k blocks. So th this is a whole function. It's called submit event proof. Now, okay. Now, again, when someone wants to contest it, they have k blocks uh, in which they are able to do it. And again, if they're right, they pay the collateral. They, they, sorry, they, they get a collateral as a word. Otherwise, um, uh, if if no one manages to disprove this event, then the original um, the, the original claimer gets this collateral. They, they get it back they, because they are the ones who put it. And uh, so yeah, so this there are some um, conditions this collateral should satisfy, which is basically at the very least it should cover the the, um, the cost of submitting and the cost of monitoring the source chain. Now, uh, yeah, submitted and monitoring not only the source chain but also the destination chain. So, let's see this function as well, and let's let's get over it quickly. So, uh, basically, we have a check that says we, if that says okay, um, this event exists and we are still within its contestation period, and now the comparison happens. And basically, the two proofs are compared. So this is the, the, the existing proof, and this is the, the new proof. And then this is, this is a scenario in which the original proof was actually uh, uh, fraudulent. And so it's, it gets cleared up. And the, the person who submitted this uh, contesting proof gets uh, collateral. So when this happens, um, um, we ba basically uh, assume that um, someone claims someone claims an event, and correctly so because the event actually happened. But time passes, and then the contestation period ends. So we have um, a way for the original claimer, or basically anyone else, to say, "Okay, this now the contestation period is over. Nothing happened, and let's let's finalize this." Um, oh no! Actually, the the author does it. I'm sorry. Correct. Correct that. Um, the, the original author has to do it because they have to get back their collateral. So um, when the contestation period is over, which is uh, verified by this, uh, the, the, the original claimer calls this finalize event function, and then basically um, their event gets added to a set of finalized events, and um, the author gets uh, collateral back. And this is a, a happy case. And then this, this smart contract, which is basically we, we've been talking about one specific smart contract all, all like during this talk. This cross-chain smart contract we will use as a base for other smart contracts, and it offers this nice um, API which says, okay, we have this event exists, and you pass it your event that you're interested in, and it can tell you did this event happen, and in, in this way you can know. So now that we have that in place, um, let's look at how we can make a two-way peg. And let's first look at what a two-way two -way peg is. Um, so imagine you have some uh, Ethereum on the Ethereum chain. And for some reason, you really want to use them on Ethereum Classic because, I don't know, because you feel um, th the transactions there are cheaper. Or you have some reason. Or you want to use them at a DEX, which is at Ethereum Classic. I, I, it doesn't really matter. The, the point is that you have some reason that you want to use this Ethereum on Ethereum Classic. So what you want to be able to do is say, okay, I now transfer this asset to Ethereum Classic and then use it as a like. I use it as a regular token. I send it to people. I send it to smart contracts. I, I do whatever with it. And then um, you w basically want to say, okay, when I'm done with it on Ethereum Classic, I want to return this on Ethereum and keep using it there if I want to. So th this is what a, a two-way peg is. And um, now let's look at how we make it, basically. So we have two smart contracts to do it, which both um, inherit from this cross-chain smart contract I, 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 I showed already as a base. And the first smart contract is this, this, this X, which is on, on Ethereum. And there's a second smart contract, which we call Y, which is on Ethereum Classic. So. <coughs> The, the Y smart contract 
it basically represents an, an ERC20 token that mirrors Ethereum um, on Ethereum Classic. So what we want to make is you basically have a token that when you have it, it's like you have one Ethereum. Um, and the way you get this token is by, the, the, the only way to get it, except if someone sends it to you, is by basically freezing your um, Ethereum in the smart contract X. Uh, when you do that, like the, your Ethereum in the smart contract X is locked, and then um, if you have some um, Ethereum tokens, some F20 tokens as we call them, on Ethereum Classic, you can basically take them back on, you can recover them on Ethereum by destroying them there. So this is like the same, the same slide as before, but with, with the details we have now. So basically, if I have Ethereum, I move them in this, in this, in this contract, and then I somehow transfer this, and we'll see how it's done, to, to Ethereum Classic, which basically mints those tokens, those ETH20 tokens, and then anything can happen here. Like, we can send them to someone else. That doesn't matter. But then at this point, someone who has them says, OK, now I want to destroy them and get Ethereum. And um, so, by, let, let's for a moment assume that this can be done easily and this can be done easily. And when you burn um, X, X Bitcoin, when you burn like any amount, when you burn five Bitcoin, uh, five Ethereum, sorry, when you burn five Ethereum, you get five Ethereum uh, 20 tokens. And then when you burn, um, when you destroy uh, five uh, F20 tokens here, you get five eighth. If we assume this is true, which it will be, and we'll show how it's done, um, then there's an argument to be made that the price of, of this token is actually um, the, the, the same as, as ETH, basically. So they had the, it's a one-to-one a, a -one correspondence. And the reason is that if the prices were any different, there exist some arbitrage opportunities. So if, um, if the Ethereum price is higher, then you basically buy, buy, buy the token, then convert it to Ethereum, and then sell that, and vice versa. So this is kind of an argument to, as to why these tokens basically will end up having the, the same price. And so um, w with this, we, we now see that, OK, now we took ETH. We brought them to Ethereum Classic and back, basically. And now let's, let's um, delve more into the, the details of how this, this transfer, basically, how, how this part is done. So um, we, uh, I, I will start now referring to these chains by their genesis. And um, for, for a moment, stay with me and assume that Ethereum and Ethereum Classic have different genesis. Um, and um, so, yeah. So the the two chains again. This says that they need to be Turing complete. And the important new thing here is that these chains. We have the assumption that independently they are secure. So th this is an important assumption. The, the only one we have to make. And what we will do is, and we kind of showed already, is that we make a token which mirrors. The, the token on, on Ethereum, but we, here we call it G1. We, Ethereum called G1. So this is the, um, basically the, the, the code for this smart contract. Um, again, um, this, this, this is on, on Ethereum. This is sidechain one, and uh, it inherits from Coschain. And the, again, the information it needs to know, it needs to know what the genesis of Ethereum Classic is, and like it does have it here of the other chain, so G2, and then it also needs to know the address of, of the same smart contract on Ethereum Classic. Now again, this shows that the, the genesis is recorded, and this is an initialization that can only happen once, and uh, before it's done, um, the contract is defunct, after it's done, it, it can be done again. So we want to basically record a specific event that happens here. And this event is that um, when, um, when we want to obtain funds on the destination chain or Ethereum Classic, what happens is, what we want to ensure is someone paid money into contract X 
and uh, they locked it, and this transaction actually happened. It's in a block, then this block is stable, and it happened on the um, um, Ethereum chain. And um, yeah, so we have um, a Solidity event that's fired when this happens on X, and then they, this, this, this whole event is basically the proof that it happened for the, the smart contract on Ethereum Classic. Does it work? Yeah. So what we do is we have two smart contracts. Um, if we pay um, uh, if we pay Ethereum on on this one, we are able to send it over to Ethereum Classic. And um, if if someone from Ethereum Classic has um, basically destroyed the token, they can prove it here and and get it in Ethereum. And uh, the same thing happens here. So let's see what, what this deposit does. Um, this first deposit happens on, uh, on uh, Ethereum. And uh, so this is basically a payable function. So we don't need to, um, to do any, uh, to mention the amount or anything here. And so we say, um, OK, we took this money, which is this message value. And it went, it, uh, we wanted to go to, to this address. And then this is a, just a, a counter. And uh, then this, this emits an event. And um, uh, say, uh, a similar thing happens here. Um, here is on the Ethereum Classic chain. We, we have some token, and we want to get it on Ethereum. What do we do? We deposit, which is basically an ERC20 token here. And we basically, this basically takes this amount that we say we want to, to, to destroy and obtain on Ethereum. Um, it, it gets removed from our balance, and then this event is emitted. And again, this, this is the event. This is the, uh, the other event. This is, again, the initialization. We, we went through it. And now we, we want to look at what, like the other side. So we, we saw, yeah, we saw how we um, take money uh, by depositing. Now we want to look at uh, withdrawing. So this now this this withdraw function happens uh, when someone um, destroys their tokens, their eighth twenty tokens on Ethereum Classic. It makes sure that this event was fired, the event that we saw before. Make sure that this event was fired, and if it was, then it sends basically the color of the amount. And uh, I, I think this is, this is actually a mistake here. This should, this should be target. And, uh, and on, the, on the second smart contract, this is on Ethereum Classic. The, uh, uh, someone calls this when on, on Ethereum, someone has paid money into contract X. And this ensures that the appropriate event was fired. And then it credits them that amount as an E20 token. And now this is like the whole contract, which I, I think we don't need. And now um, Dionysus will um, come up and keep going with Nipopaus, which is a way to basically improve this. OK, hi, everyone. I'm Dionysus. Um, is it too loud? OK, in the light. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Uh, OK, so uh, the way Kostis presented these smart contracts, um, he, t he talked to you about this central piece of these uh, smart contracts here, which is called event exists, which verifies something happens on the remote chain. And we kind of kept it hidden because he's told you that, oh, you know, the way, we, the way that this works is we have this parent smart contract that everybody inherits from. And within that smart contract, there is this, w it basically maintains the chain of all the blocks uh, all the block headers of the remote chain. Um, so the way that it was presented, event exists essentially requires that every remote block header is sent to the blockchain uh, for verification. So in our example, when we're working here in Ethereum, Ethereum needs to know every header of Ethereum Classic. Obviously, this is not very efficient. In fact, uh, if you try to do that in practice, this will exhaust gas uh, limits. Uh, uh, quite below b before you reach the point where you can run these verifications. Here, you want me to stay here? Okay. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so obviously this is not very efficient. So we want, or it doesn't really work at all. So we want to see how do we want, how are we able to do that um, without sending the whole chain. Uh, before I get into the details of Nipopaus, which is the way to do that, I just want to ask the audience if there's any questions on the construction we showed so far, because we will get a little bit more technical now. So um, any questions about the smart contracts that were presented previously? Okay, so uh, let's move on to Nipopause. So the question with Nipopause is essentially, you have this kind of um, situation where you have this verifier, uh, in our case, this is a smart contract, and you have several provers, some of which are honest and some of which are adversarial, and all of them are submitting some information to the smart contract. The way we showed it before, we said they will submit the chain of all headers of the remote chain. Uh, however, we want to somehow optimize this. And the question we're trying to ask is, can we do that without submitting every header? Or um, do we have to submit every header, or can we do it in a compressed manner? Can we send less data here between those two provers to the smart contract um, so that this is more efficient and we can do it within the gas limits of the existing blockchains? And one thing I want to repeat that Kostis already said is that the point in these smart contracts is that we want them to work over existing blockchains. We don't want to build a new blockchain system where there's weird stuff happening, right? So we want to do it on top of existing systems. Um, so the protocol we're uh, looking for is both of these will send some sort of proof, short proof, uh, Pi 1 and Pi 2. And these are not really the chains themselves, but they're some sort of compressed form of the chain that attests to the fact that there, um, ha that there has been some work that happened on that chain but without actually revealing all of it. And somehow the verifier needs to then know whether that the event that it's trying to verify happened or not. Um, so over here, the verifier is asking about an event. This event Q is what Costis talked about, uh, whether a transaction happened, whether a particular payment happened, or whether an event happened within a smart contract. And that event pertains to the actual chain that is the longest chain on the underlying protocol. Um, However, here we don't want to we don't want to send the whole headers. Um, so the question is, what are these sort of strings that the these provers need to provide to the smart contract so that the smart contract can perform some sort of comparison between them and know that this event happened or this event didn't happen? Um, so what we're looking at uh, really in in reality here is that uh, the the adversarial prover what they are trying to do is. They could be a mining adversary, so they could be trying to extend the source blockchain, they could be trying to mine blocks, create forks and so on. However, they need to, we need to be able, as verifiers, to reject their claims if they belong to not the longest chain of our um, system. If it belong to a shorter chain than the current longer chain, their events need to be um, rejected. So that's the question, how do we do that? Um, so the basic idea is based on uh, extending the um, proof-of-work equation that um, Bitcoin and Monero and Ethereum all use. It's all the same. So let me just remind you uh, what this equation looks like. So recall that we're using a hash function. Um, it could be like SHA-256 in Bitcoin. We pass up the block header, and then we check if it's below a certain target T. So if it's a small number, then this equation is successful, and this is a valid bro block with a valid proof-of-work. Um, and we we consider this hash function to work as a random oracle. So if you pass it, what does that mean? It means if you pass it uh, some new data that you haven't asked it before, you can assume that the output of this hash function is randomly distributed completely uniformly over its uh, space. Okay, so this is the interesting observation that we're making, um, and this is the basis of the construction that, that allows us to compress blockchains. And the idea here is that we want to have these sort of super blocks. Basically, we're not creating a new block type. We are looking at the existing blocks of the blockchain, and we're looking at certain blocks. We're naming those super blocks if they have a certain attribute. And this pertains to blocks of the source blockchain. Um, and we call something a super block if it satisfies this equation. So let me just go over that. So, so all of the blocks satisfy this part of the equation here up to T. 
So the hash of the block is less than or equal to t. But some of the blocks that we are dealing with will satisfy this equation really, really nicely, much more than is required by um, the consensus protocol. In particular, if you're thinking of blocks as um, having a hash that starts with a particular number of zeros to make them valid blocks, what we're talking about here in terms of super blocks is blocks that have many more zeros at the beginning of their hash than are needed. And in particular, a uh, mu number of zeros that are extraneous and are not needed. So this is uh, the, the so-called mu, su mu super target. And if a block satisfies this equation with an additional number of mu zeros, we call it a mu super block. So if it has an extra zero, it's a one super block. If it has 10 extra zeros, it's a 10 super block. And these super blocks get really, really rare as you increase mu. So if you make mu, um, let's say 10, then only one in a thousand blocks is a 10 super block. Uh, and to, to, to be precise, uh, this is the probability that a block will be a super block of level mu, given the fact that it is a valid block. So if it is a valid block, uh, then the probability that it reaches that mu super block property is given by this two to the minus mu. So all blocks are zero super blocks, half of them are one super blocks, then a quarter of them become two super blocks, an eighth become a three super block, and so on. Essentially, these the number of blocks that are at the next level are half uh, in expectation than the ones in the previous one. So that's what we mean by a super block. Uh, so our chain, um, so we, this is what we call the level of a super block. You can actually write it out mathematically, but it's exactly what I described. So this is actually how the blockchain looks like if you render it under these lens of super blocks. So the chain is really just a zero level. There's nothing changed. We don't modify the consensus protocol, but we just interpret it in a certain manner. And um, what we're looking at is we're observing that some of the blocks are one super blocks, like there, and some of the blocks are two super blocks, and some of the blocks are three super blocks. So you can see half of the blocks are one super blocks, then half of those are two, and then half of these are three super blocks. So they become really rarer as you go up. And this is just an interpretation of the underlying chain. This is not new blocks uh, mined on top. The chain remains the same. So using this idea, we can compress the proof of work that happened on the chain. And the way we do that is, uh, by the way, this is a probabilistic data structure because um, blocks are block hashes are random, so it might not be distributed as nicely as is shown here. This is just probabilistically the expectation. And actually, it's it's. It looks like that, but you might have some distribution that has some differences here, so it might not look as symmetric as this picture. Okay, so the idea in creating these nipopows, or the, um, the proofs from the provers to the verifiers that are compressed, is that we will just send super blocks instead of sending the whole chain headers. So we will send some representative blocks, or block headers, that somehow capture the fact that proof of work happened without sending the whole proof of work. And this is why we call these proofs of proof of work, because they prove that proof of work happened without actually showing all the proof of work. And the, the, this, this is called popow, proof of proof of work. And the knee on the knee popow means non-interactive, because we just generated one, send it to the smart contract, and then the smart contract can verify it on its own. So here's the basic gist of the idea. And um, so the way we do it is, we choose a specific level mu. Suppose we choose a level mu is equal to 10. And then what we say is, OK, I will not send you the whole chain, and the whole chain headers. I will just look at all the blocks that are 10 super blocks. And those 10 super blocks that are only 1,000th of the um, size of the blockchain, only for these, I will send you the headers. And then what I ask the smart contract to do is compare who is sending the most super blocks instead of who is sending the most blocks. Uh, and based on that, again, based on how many uh, are uh, more, how, how, which proof has the most length, um, that's the one that wins. So the protocol now looks like this. You send two short proofs, um, which are essentially just super block headers, and they are compared like that. So you count the number of super blocks of that particular level mu, and you see which one has the most. Uh, and that mu, for now, you can assume it's it's just a fixed constant. You can s think of it as mu is equal to 10. The, sup the smart contract fixes that. It checks that everything inside here has proof of work, which is 
with 10 extra zeros and then looks at these chains to see how they compare, even though they have skipped many blocks. They have skipped a thousand blocks for every super block that is presented there. And again, the Merkle tree proof of inclusion within one of these blocks is fully included. And um, for the purposes of, these of this talk, you can just assume that the uh, transaction is a part of one of these super blocks, um, even though um, if it is not, we have mechanisms to actually show that it is part of the chain that is underlying there. Um, yeah. Okay, so one of the problems in this construction, as I showed it like uh, before, is that if you just send super blocks, there is no ordering in, in them because there is no prev ID pointer as we're used to in Bitcoin or Monero um, where we have every, point, every block pointing to its parent. So we need a mechanism to have these sort of blocks short, uh, uh, sorted in a, in a way that is chronological, in the way that they were generated, in the same order they were generated. Because if we don't do that, then it's possible that the adversary will just reorder the blocks and cause us to think that the blockchain has a different order than it actually does. Um, so we need to extend our structure to look a little bit like that. So we want the blockchain, instead of having a prev ID pointer between every, every two blocks, we want every block to also point to its most recent block at the same level. So you can see here, every zero level block, of course, points to the most recent zero, super, the zero block, but every one super block points to the most recent one super block, and every two super block points to the most recent two super block, and so on. And by the way, if, if something is a two super block, if something is a three super block, it's also a two super block, because if something starts with three zeros, it also starts with two zeros. So we want these kind of extra pointers to exist within, between blocks. Um, this is not something that exists in the current implementations of blockchains. Um, however, there is, um, there is, first of all, in Ethereum, there is a plan to add this kind of structure in uh, EIP-210, which is going to be uh, adopted soon. And even if it's not adopted as part of the consensus layer, we can actually extend the existing um, data structure of um, of existing blockchains to include these pointers without a soft fork and without a, a hard fork. Uh, and we have some uh, literature references at the end that you can look at for that. Um, so actually, this is not a, uh, a problem in what we're trying to do here. OK, so let me just say a, a few words about how this actually works, because I skipped some of the technical details um, to make it a little bit more precise, uh, because it's not sufficient to just send super blocks. And the reason being, uh, oop, oops, there we go. Okay, so the problem is, uh, let's see. The problem is if you're trying to just connect, if you're just trying to compare two chains, that one happens on one one is about Ethereum and one is one is about the um, the longest chain in Ethereum. The other one is about a fork of Ethereum, and you just send super blocks. It's possible that these two proofs diverge really close to the end. Of, uh, so they're really close to most recent most recent blocks, and the problem with that is that you cannot really do a, f a fair comparison of that. It has security problems. So um, the way that we actually build these um, proofs is that what we want to do is the verifier needs to be able to compare these proofs at any level mu that it chooses. So here's the construction. Let me show you the construction, and then I will talk about precisely how the comparison happens. Um, so first of all, um, this is this is how the the honest prover will construct a proof that it will uh, send to the smart contract. So it takes uh, the actual chain, which is the whole chain of all the block headers of the chain it's trying to prove things about. So the source chain, uh, it takes a certain number of blocks from the end, uh, k number of blocks, uh, which could be six, and those blocks it sends um, it sends all of them in that proof. So the last six blocks of the chain are always sent. So that's called the suffix of the proof. Now, for the prefix part, which is the stable part of the blockchain, this is the long part of the blockchain that we wish to compress. So the way we do that is we have some sort of uh, security parameter m. And that security parameter could be something like m is equal to 3. I will show the example with m is equal to 3. If you want to make it secure, this as a parameter you want to grow to a larger number, let's say around 100. Um, the way we do that is we start with a chain. Um, we start with a level of super blocks that has at least m blocks. So 
in this case, we're looking at m is equal to 3. We want to include the top level of superblocks that has at least um, three blocks. So in this example, there's only one three superblock. And so that one, we, will, we don't want to include that. But the top level that has at least m is equal to three blocks, which in this case is level two, uh, we want to include it fully. And then what, we are do what we're going to do is we're going to look at, so we're going to look at the top level that has at least m is equal to three uh, super blocks. And then we will look at the suffix within that level that has a length of three. And we, are, we will try to fill in all the blocks on the level below that connect these two ends of this level here, level two. So those are the blocks that we include from level one. And again, we, we do the same thing at level one. So we look at the last three blocks of level one, and we fill in all the span here with zero level super blocks. Okay, so we do this. Uh, obviously, this is a, a toy example. In real Bitcoin, this is going to be like 30, 37 levels. So we start at the top level, and we start filling them in. But because we fill in, we, we just take m blocks from the end, this level here will just have three blocks included. This one will cover those blocks, and this one will cover those blocks. So what I want to argue here is two things. I want to give just a bit of intuition about how the comparison is going to go. and That's the first thing. And the second thing I want to show you is that I want to argue why this sort of proof is short. So why there's not too many blocks needed when you send this kind of proof. So um, about the second part first, uh, these blocks here that I've highlighted are all part of this proof pie. So this is exactly what is submitted to the smart contract. We want this to be a, sh a short amount of block, a small amount of, amount of blocks, because we want this to be gas efficient. Okay, so at the top level, we're just including about m blocks because it's the top level, it's the highest level that has at least m blocks. So this will have about between m and two m blocks. And let's think about why this is true. Uh, well, first of all, it has at least m blocks because this is our requirement. We require to have at least m blocks. But I'm arguing that it will not have more than two m blocks because if it had more than two m blocks here, because this level has about half the blocks that this level has. Then if this had two m blocks, then the higher level would have m blocks. And that would be the higher level, the highest level that has m blocks. So that would have been included as the top level. Okay, so the top level has between m and two m blocks. Let's say it has about m blocks. Now every next level that we that we fill in in this manner will have exact or will have approximately two m blocks. Why? If this level, if this level we take the suffix, which is of length m, and we fill it in. Because the level below will have double the blocks that the top, the, the level above it has, the level below will have 2m if this has m. Here we take another suffix that is of length m, and we fill it in with the blocks of the previous level. So again, that makes 2m. And then if we were to go on, we would again take m blocks from the end, fill them in, take m blocks from the end, fill them in, and so on. So for every level, we take about 2m blocks. Now, I want to. Um, emphasize that the number of levels that we see here is going to be small. Um, why is this? So if the blockchain itself has C blocks, then the one super chain has C halves, the two super chain has C quarter blocks, and so on, until we reach a chain that has just one block, and then we're done. But how many times do you have to divide C by two to get to one? Well, that's just the binary logarithm of the chain size. So the number of levels that you see here is just logarithmic in the number of blocks that have been included in the chain itself. Um, so essentially, this grows logarithmically with time. The number of levels grows logarithmically with time. Um, it grows really, really slowly as time evolves. So the argument here is that the number of blocks at each level is a constant that we choose. It could just be 100. The number of different levels is something that grows very slowly. Therefore, these proofs are going to be short. And in fact, we have some measurements that you can look at in our papers that show that this is actually the case. So this is the argument for something we call succinctness. Succinctness says that these proofs are exponentially better than uh, actually sending the whole chain of headers. Uh, and if you want to look at it at, at asymptotic notation, this is the kind of expression we're looking at. It's the logarithm of the chain 
times m, which is the, so this is the number of levels. This is the blocks that we include in every level. And this is the fixed number of blocks that we send at the end. So the proof size is really quite small. It's, it's poorly logarithmic in the chain. It's actually logarithmic in the chain. So this is uh, essentially an exponential improvement over sending the whole chain itself. So for the security argument, what we want to do is we want to compare two NIPOPALs that were sent by two verifiers. One is the NIPOPAL uh, that the adversary is sending. The other is the NIPOPAL that the honest party is sending. And we want to see who's talking about the longest chain on the source blockchain. Who, who, is, who has the longest chain there? But in order to do that, what we're, do what we're doing is as follows. And this will kind of give you some intuition about why we do this whole business with multiple levels where we kind of try to fill in the level below with um, covering the, the blocks at the level above. Uh, okay, so the way we do this comparison is that the smart contract receives these two proofs, pi1 and pi2. Uh, pi1 and pi2 are just chains of blocks that have some blocks skipped. Most of the blocks are skipped. And what it does is it tries to find a common, uh, a common prefix between these two. Uh, and this common prefix will be non-empty because, so this, what this notation means is just the common blocks between, between these two chains. Uh, this, this common blocks, these common blocks between these two chains will necessarily have at least one block because both of them ha have to start from the same genesis. And between these two common blocks, we find the most recent block. So that's what this means. So from this chain of the common blocks between these two proofs, we take the, the, late, the latest one. And now we want to do a comparison and say, OK, this guy's right, this guy's wrong. One of them is lying about what is the longest chain. So what we do is we take this, the, the most recent common block between these two. And then uh, I am using kind of a weird notation here. Let me just explain what that means, is for every level mu, we are looking at the blocks of, so, okay. So for every one of these two proofs, pi one and pi two, we take only the part after that common block. We take the, com the, the, the part after that common block and we only look at one particular level of our choice mu. And the choice we make for that mu is we take the higher one, the highest one, that in this kind of portion of the blockchain has at least n blocks. So the length of the proof from the block B and afterwards at this level mu has at least n blocks. Uh, if you look at the construction that we have, this will always be possible to do. Uh, and we have a very elaborate argument uh, in the uh, actual math that we do, but I hope this gives you the intuition about why this happens. Um, so after we choose a level mu where this happens in both of these chains, what we do is we compare the lengths after this particular block. So the length comparison happens after the common block, which is time that the two different parties would have to have mined independently of each other. The, the, one of them cannot use the work that the other one has stored. Um, so I know this is a long, to, a, a long um, formula to take in within a short, um, short talk, but um, I hope this kind of motivates you to look at the uh, work we're doing um, and, and the papers where the more of the details are in there. Um, okay, I will skip these but give you some of the references that we have so that you can take a look at these. Um, so first of all, the non-interactive proofs of proofs of work construction is a paper we're publishing in Financial Crypto uh, in February. So this has all of the mathy things where it talks about how you construct these proofs, how do you do this comparison and why this is secure. Um, then we have this um, proof of work side chains, which is essentially the um, first part of the talk that Costis showed you that explains why the smart contract works. Um, and this was from Financial Crypto last year. Um, this is, I think, it's an easy paper. Um, you can uh, take a look at the smart contracts and even implement it. Um, then we have a proof of burn paper that shows how can you destroy money on one chain. And um, using the previous mechanisms, you can uh, prove that money was destroyed and transferred to a different chain. Uh, and then um, some of the other interesting things here are this compact storage of superblocks for NIPPOW applications as well as enabling NIPPOW applications on Bitcoin Cash. These are uh, basically uh, an implementation in practice of these ideas. 
uh, we were able to do this in actual Bitcoin Cash. We use Bitcoin Cash because it just has cheaper fees, but it doesn't make any difference. You can do the same thing on uh, Bitcoin itself. So we did it on um, we did it, we did it on Bitcoin Cash uh, testnet. Actually, this is Gosti's master thesis, um, and um, it was deployed and it was done without actually doing any soft forks or hard forks. So that's an interesting piece of work. And then um, there's another master thesis from last year that shows how to do this in an Ethereum smart contract. And this one also has a few measurements that show that this has sufficient gas efficiency compared to sending the whole chain. So um, yeah, I know this is a lot of, or of um, math to take in. This is why I ha we have all these references and I hope you can take a look at these to, um, to dive uh, in a little bit more depth in what we're doing here. We also have a website called uh, nipopals.com that you can look at. It has all of these references and a few more videos that um, show you some of the details of um, how we do these things. Um, yeah, that's all I have. Uh, so thank you very much. And we'll be, uh, we will be taking some questions. We have some, some uh, time for questions now. Do you have any formula for computing the amount of the collateral of the deposit? Because I fear that even if the deposit is quite large, if, uh, if the mining uh, works for a long amount of time, no one has an incentive to actually perform the checking because there's never any, any gain made for it. And yeah, that seems to be a problem for me. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we have this kind of, um, you have it somewhere here, right, about the collateral. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so we have it here, like we have some intuition here that it has to be sufficient to uh, cover for fraud proofs. I get your argument that even if this is sufficient, basically, uh, due to economic reasons, nobody's going to do it because they will always get caught. Yeah. So um, there is a more advanced argument on that on the Truebit paper, which is not ours, that gives some mechanisms in which basically one way you can do that is you can sometimes conceal the fact that a, that a proof was fraudulent and then um, you, can, you, get, you get paid for finding that so that you encourage people to, to find it because you you ensure that sometimes there will be some fraudulent proofs that will get paid out, but you hide the fact that they're fraudulent before the before actually revealing that. So these are some ideas that you can use. Uh, the Truebit paper has some nice construction that I think uh, we don't have it implemented here, but this is something something in our radar. So there's definitely interest for future work there. Thank you very much, everyone.